And hello. Hello, hello, hello. 26 people. Holy shit. How did I, all these people get here today? It's okay. It's going to be a pretty easy lecture, in my opinion. Um, basically, we're doing chapter eight now, and we're starting out with general um, uh, genetics kind of stuff. Stuff you should have learned probably in Bio 101, but if not, definitely genetics. But we're reviewing here again because we're going to go more in depth in it eventually. Daffy Duck shows up. Who's this loony person, this Looney Tunes person that keeps coming? I don't think you're on my roster, mister. Okay, why don't we just go ahead and get started? Like I said, I don't think this is going to be a very long lecture, but it's going to be wonderful. No quiz? Nope, no quiz. Sorry, guys. I spent all morning putting this uh, lecture together, so I ended up without any time left to make a quiz for y'all. For y'all. I hate the word y'all. It's too Southern. For you guys. You guys. That's more Pennsylvania. Come on, man. Your people dropping like flies. Oh, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. I lost four people by not having a quiz. Guess what? We're going to do the quiz in, in a different time frame next time. You see? Dr. Slish doesn't like to be used. Okay. So let's go to this. Sorry, just arranging my landscape here. My notes. Oops, 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 oops. oops. If you guys know who it was that left right after they found there wasn't a quiz, I'd appreciate it if you would uh, send them a message, tell them they're jerks. Jerks. Okay. So this chapter is about differentiation, basically. We've been talking about it all along. I've been kind of assuming everyone knows the things that I'm talking about, but um, now we're going to go in particular how things differentiate. Um, in 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 terms of G, uh, hormones activating receptors, turning in transcription factors, transcription factors activating genes, making new proteins. So we've been kind of assuming you knew what I was talking about all along. Now we're going to get into more detail here. So how is it when you start out with cells that are very generic, at least seemingly generic? There's nothing different about any of these eight cells. Of course, we know they're slightly different and they will become different very shortly. How do you go from that into these highly differentiated, very specific cells in the adult? What is it that causes a cell to become all this, uh, all this different here? Let me play a, a quick uh, animation for you. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Change my share. So there was this guy, Conrad Waddington. Here's a name for you. Do you think he's English? Conrad Waddington came up with this metaphor for how cells become differentiated during differentiate during development. So you've got all these generic cells and they start rolling downhill. And every now and then there's a decision point. And some cells go in one direction, become one type of thing. And then there's another decision point and they change again and change again and they keep changing till they get all the way down to the bottom of the hill and now they can't change anymore they are what they are okay this is you know, stop already <laughs> so once they reach the bottom of it they are um they are fully differentiated they're not dividing and they're done okay kind of a Bad animation of a neat of a neat concept. So let's talk about that in depth here. So 
So here, this is the basic idea that, you know, you start out with, with a very generic cell. Got to chat real quick. Who's my chat? Who's my chatter? Damn it. Chat, what does the hill represent? Okay. So let me just go into more detail on that then. Okay, so the basic idea is the hill, the peak, damn it, Arr, struggling today. The hill is basically, the peak is, is undifferentiated cells. So this is where cells start out um, in the embryo. They're totally undifferentiated. And then they reach kind of inflection points here. And this kind of represents being hit with one hormone or not being hit with that hormone. And when it gets hit with that hormone, it goes down a different path. Now, it's all downhill, which means that once they get changed into this type of cell, they can't go back up and around and then become over here. They go down in this pathway. So each decision point there bifurcates into, two, into different possible uh, outcomes. And as the, the ball goes down the hill or as the cells go down the differentiation pathway, they meet many of these decision points and they can go one way or the other. Once they go down this way, they're going to stay there. At the end of this hill, there's a valley where the, where the balls get stuck. They don't go any further. And that is fully differentiated. So they're very specific, they can go backwards, and they can't divide anymore. So each cell follows its own path. Decision points represent gene transcription or changes in gene transcription. And that's caused by different hormones or signal transduction, things that happen along the way. Conrad Waddington. Okay, so that's the general overview of, of how to think about this. Now, another thing to keep in mind about this whole process is that determination often precedes um, differentiation or always precedes differentiation. So what do I mean by that? So a cell may look undifferentiated and yet it's already determined that it's going to become somewhere. So um, the determination, here, here are our early, em, our early xenopus embryo. These endo, um, endodermal cells here, they all kind of look the same. I mean, if you looked at them under a light microscope, each separately, they're all identical. They look the same, but they're not identical. Some have already been determined that they're going to be at the dorsal end, right? Because after the sperm entry, you get cortical rotation and those dorsal determinants end up over here. So these cells are determined, although they're not differentiated yet. Determination always precedes it because determination involves turning on transcription factors and they don't have any phenotypic, um, phenotypically cells don't look different when they have different transcription factors turned on until those transcription factors produce proteins that cause phenotypic changes in them. So differentiation then is when the phenotypic change has happened and you can actually see it in the cell. And determination is when those genes have been turned on and now they're on that new pathway and they're heading in that direction. Um, and the thing about um, determination is once you've, you've gone down, you've been determined, and the cell divides then, the progeny of that original cell keep that same determination because that set of genes that have been turned on will stay on as they go down that, that pathway. Um, yeah, so here with our example here, these guys look the same as everything else, but they've got these beta catenin increasing determinants here, which means you know a few stages from now, these are gonna start putting out um, uh, high, high concentrations of nodals, X-wins, and or X, XNRs, and that will that fact of releasing all that stuff is a differentiation, and it produces phenotypic results. Okay. 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 Sorry, still rearranging. Okay, so what are we talking about? Um, usually, when 
the transcription factors get turned on in this well no that's not what i want to say um some okay some transcription factors are more general in that they're like your fgf will turn on something like ets and ets causes the cell to to divide that's kind of a general thing others are more specific until in that they are going to cause that determination so that the cells can then have a restricted fate from them being turned on so these are your master regulatory genes so they determine how something will differentiate so an example is myod myod is a classic uh, uh, differentiation factor it specifies the muscle uh, specifies muscle so when myod comes up those cells will become muscle um, and you can even take myod and put it into a non-muscle cell and suddenly it becomes a muscle cell and that's how specific it is and how, how regulatory and it's considered a master regulatory gene because it will turn on a bunch of genes and those genes will go on to turn on other genes so it's not directly um directly activating all the muscle specific genes but it it's activating muscle other transcription factors that will turn on muscle specific genes so it's kind of like a an a, a hierarchy of control and um uh, so it's it's coordinating this whole conversion of the cell from whatever it is into a muscle cell and this is myod itself it's a basic helix helix loop helix transcription factor and i'll talk about that shortly um so just to keep that in the back of your head that there are different types of transcription factors in, in many respects okay So how a cell then responds to, um, to any kind of hormone or signal is determined to a certain extent by what hormones or signals it previously saw. So its developmental history determines how it's going to respond to this new signal. And that's because you've got many different transcription factors that are acting in different combinations. So this is kind of a general way of looking at how different combinations can produce different um, tissues. So here we've got only three different genes, and by using in, them in different combinations, we can end up with what's it, three, six, seven, eight different types of cell. Okay, if we only turn on gene X, we get this. X and Y gets this. X, Y, and Z together gets this. Just Z. Okay, and on and on and on. No genes, that it ends up like this. So this kind of coordinated control of transcription is really important in determining what the cell is going to be in the end. Um, and uh, so an example of this kind of um, like a hormone, uh, let's see, the response to hormones is dependent on the cell's developmental history. Um, current transcriptional, in other words, the current transcriptional state of the cell will determine how it's going to respond to new transcription factors. So an example of that we talked about when we were talking about chick gastrulation. If you remember the very early steps um, when Kohler sickle is starting that um, primitive streak involved FGF. And FGF is important at this point to cause cell division to make more cells that are going to then ingress. Um, but normally, so that's FGF causing ectodermal cells to, to become, uh, you know, do the um, MET and then crawl through. But normally, FGF hitting ectodermal cells will cause them to become neural, but it doesn't happen here, right? And that's because at the time we said they're not competent to respond to FGF in that way. Uh, once the primitive streak has finished, those cells are still releasing FGF, and now FGF is inducing neuro from the from the epidermal, um, ectodermal, and that's because at that state, at that stage, now they're ready. Why? Because of their um, their transcriptional history. The the at the early stage, those ectodermal cells have got their DNA all, you know, crunched up. Um, the neural genes are all crunched up because they haven't been hit with the transcription factors that would change the the um, or, or the signaling molecules that would change the the chromatin structure to open up those genes yet. So FGF isn't going to activate that yet. But later on, they have been, 
and now those genes are available and FGF causes neural induction. So point being, um, how a cell responds to any particular signal is based on what signals it's seen in the past. What is it competent to respond to? What is its developmental history at that point? Very complicated process. Okay, so that's kind of the broad general scope of what's going on. Now let's look more specifically at um, how genes are controlled. And again, at this point, we're talking really general genetics, um, maybe even bio 101, but it's important to review this at this point, just so we know what we're talking about. So there are two different types of regulatory element. One is called cis and the other is called trans. If you remember from organic chemistry, I know you all loved organic chemistry as much as I did. Remember when we had a double bond, you always had either cis or trans, right? Cis or trans rather double bond. And that's because, let's see, you could, if you have a strict, you have a double bond, then um, it, the, the bond is planar. And then the, the two different things coming off of that, okay, C double bond C, right? And that's planar. And then you can have things going off this way, opposite from each other, that's trans, or you can have things going off on the same side, that's cis. So cis is the same, trans is opposite or different anyway. So it's similar kind of logic here. Cis is when the element is connected to the gene. And again, put your, put your mind in the, in the place of someone, you know, 100, 130 years ago who didn't know what genes were, didn't even know there was DNA, didn't know anything like that. All they know is this is connected to, to the expression of the gene all the time. So cis is always connected to the gene and why? Because it's a piece of DNA that's part of the whole structure of the gene. It's, an, it's a regulatory element that's right next to the gene. So the gene being the, uh, um, uh, the coding regions, all the exons and introns of the actual thing, these are regulatory elements of DNA that are right next to it. So cis then is the DNA, which is right here. Trans then, the, tra the gene for the trans can be anywhere, right? It, it could be anywhere in the genome, but it affects this particular gene because it's going to bind to it. So that's what we mean by trans. It's not directly connected to the gene, but it controls the gene. So I'm just trying to explain the cis-trans uh, um, nomenclature. And it's not that important, I guess, as long as you remember that the, the trans element is the protein that's binding to it, and cis is the DNA element that's, that's part of the structure of the gene itself. When the trans meet, when trans meets cis, um, when trans meet cis, they're going to interact. And this, this is, I really like things like this because they make it more realistic. Like what is actually happening when a piece of, when a protein binds to the DNA? Here you can see the DNA, this guy here, I'm not sure what it is. One of the, one of the bases. Oh, this is a methylated cysteine. Um, okay. So it's binding to um, isoleucine here of this alpha helix of this Hox gene. So this Hox gene, I believe is a basic helix loop helix. Um, so here's a, one of the loops of the Hox gene. It's got an R gene sticking out here that's gonna interact with uh, part of the DNA. Then it's got isoleucine interacting there, isoleucine. So we've got a really, um, perfect match between the amino acid side chains and the side and the bases, the organic chemicals here of the of the DNA interacting with each other. And that's what causes the binding. So that's why if you change the sequence slightly, you change one um, base or you methylate a base, that transcription factor doesn't bind to it anymore. And so um, the, the, the interaction is very specific. So I've got a question here. Is it is it binding at the ribosome binding region of a gene or the entire gene? I'm confused. Um, hang on, I think this is, hang on to that question. Ask it again later if it doesn't make sense when we pull back a little bit and look at it more generally. So ribosome has nothing to do with what we're doing right now. This is just the DNA and transcription factors binding to it. 
but you know, hang on to that question. Ask it again in 15 minutes if we haven't answered it. Okay, so trans element is a protein, cis element is the DNA. So they're and they're interacting very specifically between the uh, amino acid side chains and the bases. Oops. So here are cis regulatory units. The, the important ones for differential regulation of different genes are these upstream control elements. They can actually be downstream as well, but they're pretty well separated from the gene. Um, <clears throat> let me just add something that I meant to add before. So these can be This can be thousands of bases upstream or downstream of the uh, of, of the promoter. Okay, so here's your co-promoter, and then here's your upstream control element. So they could be hundreds of bases away or thousands of bases away, and that's because this DNA is going to loop around, and they will interact when they um when when it's ready to to start. So we've got these upstream control elements that will bind some specific transcription factors. And then you've got your core promoter that will, will bind the, the general transcription factors. And we'll talk about that shortly. And this co core promoter is just the right number of bases away from that first base that's going to be transcribed right next to the transcription um, initiation site. Here are your trans-regulatory elements. This is our basic helix, helix loop helix. So you've got your helix here, loop, and helix two. So helix one, and you got the basic domain, and then you've got two of these together. It could be a hetero or a homo dimer. And this basic domain is reading those bases in the DNA coming into that groove. Here's a leucine zipper. So this is called leucine zipper because along this edge here, you've got a, a leucine every six or seven amino acids on both of them. Leucines being very um, uh, nonpolar in a water solution like in the cell, um, they're going to want to hide from the water. So you get two of these together and they do this and they link up together like a, like a zipper. The, uh, so the, my knuckles are the leucine side chain sticking out. I guess it's about every three amino acids, and that causes them to lock in together. That's why it's called a leucine zipper. In uh, the uh, receptor tyrosine kinase um, signal tra transduction pathway, usually I say the, the things getting turned on are June and FOSS. June and FOSS come together to make a heterodimer through this leucine zipper um, mechanism. And so again here, this part of the helix is reading the, the bases in the DNA and looking for a specific sequence. These cis elements are between six and I think 10 bases, usually about eight bases in a row in a specific sequence will, will be necessary to bind one of these trans factors. And then here's another transcription factor, zinc finger. So it's got a little bit of a, a single um, ion of zinc here that coordinates the structure of this protein. And then it's got amino acid side chains that are reading the, the DNA there. A little less elegant, I think, than the leucine zipper, which is one of my favorite transcription factors. Okay, how does this work? Let me look at my notes real quick to make sure I didn't forget something that I wanted to say. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, general versus versus specific transcription factors. So the general factors are the factors that are going to bind to the core promoter element. And the core promoter is the same in all genes and the, and the general transcription factor are the same in all genes as well. These are going to bind to this core promoter element and bring in the RNA polymerase too. And, and that's going to cause it to, to transcribe from the right position. So um, these general transcription factors, we've got six, they're all called TF2, TF2A, TF2B, TF2D, E, F, and H. So we've got six different um, general transcription factors. 
Um, they're going to bind to that that uh, core promoter, which has got the TATA box, I believe, right around here. Um, and they're going to attract that RNA polymerase to form this initiation complex or part of the initiation complex. The other part of the initiation complex is where the specificity specificity comes in, which are these enhancer regions. So these are the upstream regions and um, these need to have transcription factors bind, bound to them in order to um, form this initiation complex. Um, so what happens then is uh, these activators will bind and you can have activators or repressors. So the activators will bind to the, to the enhancer elements. They may have co-activators that will bind to them and kind of bridge the gap to the rest of this general structure here. So the um, activators and co-activators then coordinate the, uh, the, the um, general transcriptures, transcription factors coming in and arranging themselves properly so that the RNA polymerase can find its spot and go. Um, you can also have repressors. So a repressor may bind to the, to the same site as the activator but not have the site that will bring that co-activator in and cause the whole complex to go together. So repressor then binds to the, to the cis element and doesn't allow transcription to happen. You could also have a co-repressor, something that would bind to this activator and, or to the repressor and not allow transcription to happen. So we can regulate it up or down based on what proteins are, are in the cell. <laughs> okay. So humans have I guess, humans have something like three thousand trans different transcription factors, and each one is going to be looking for a specific sequence. Um, but you know the the system is a lot more complicated and elegant, really, because it isn't like one transcription act factor activates one gene. Otherwise, you need a different transcription factor for every gene. Um, one transcription factor can affect the transcription of many different genes just by having that same cis element in many different genes. But one transcription factor is not going to activate it. Like I said, you need um, usually about five transcription factors in order to get um, a gene to be turned on. So a transcription factor, SMADs are really good examples could be activators and a whole bunch of genes and repressors and a whole bunch of other genes. So they're controlling gene expression is probably a better way of saying it because it's not, it's not necessarily always activating. Okay, so our last slide already. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is the activator co-activator co co-repressor um, idea. And we talked about this when we talked about Wnt um, Wnt uh, signaling. So beta catenin is an activator. Okay. It's not a transcription factor. Like I said, I lied. It's an activator, co-activator. I mean, so in the off state, when there's no beta catenin around, we've got this co-repressor Groucho, which binds to TCF, and TCF is bound to the control element. Now, these other proteins are going to be co-repressors as well. So when Groucho is there, they all bind, and you get no transcription. When there's beta-catenin around, though, beta-catenin kicks Groucho off, and now it becomes a co-activator. So it's bound to the, to the activator, and it can help to form that transcriptional complex. So what's the bottom line here? So transcription factors then can activate a large group of common genes, or they could also be more specific and restrict to certain, certain genes that are only involved in certain tissues. So the myOD we talked about before is the more speci specific type that's only going to activate um, only going to be present in specific tissues. It's only present in muscle tissue. Um, whereas other ones like 
ETS, which is activated by uh, FGF, could be activated in a lot of different different cell types, and and it's going it's cis element will be present in a lot of different genes because FGF is more a more general thing to get things dividing. So it's going to be there to activate all of that. But what it's going to divide into is based more on these specific things like MyOD. And in this chapter, we're going to go into specifics of um, uh, muscle differentiation and blood cell differentiation. And we'll see how these specific factors will have different, different effects in different cells. Well, the same effect in every cell, but different transcription factors for different cells. Upstream regulatory regions can have many cis regulatory elements. Okay, so each particular gene has got many cis regulatory elements. So it may have an, a regulatory element for FGF, which is just going to turn this gene on in, in a general state, but also some more specific ones. So that gene may be you know, ready to be turned on, but not turned on because it's not in the right tissue kind of a thing. Um, hang on one second, don't go anywhere. Oops, got a chat. What is TCF? TCF is, is the activator that works with, um, uh, with beta catenin. So TCF is a transcription factor. Basically, it stands for T cell factor or something like that, because that's where it was discovered. But basically, it, it works in that wind pathway along with beta catenin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'm just looking for a figure that I didn't include that clue that I may have. Chat. All right, so let me just show you this real quick. Let me, well, what's the chat? Come on, <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> Let's be kind to each other, people. Let's be kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is kind of along that range where here's your upstream control element and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 different things bound here. MAD is a SMAD. Okay, it's, it's basically a, related to TGF beta pathway. So that gets activated by BMP and uh, nodals and things. So you've got that turned on in different places. You've got ETS, which is a an FGF factor, which is on, which is here, here, and here. TCF, which is in the wind pathway. So you've got a, one site for those. And then you've got these other things. Twist. Remember that got turned on in the somites or somites? No, in the um, neural crust cells, right? So you can see you've got different signaling here. You've got TGF beta signaling, you've got wind signaling and FGF signaling, kind of like in that neural crest where all those different signalings are happening. Um, but you also have some specific things that need to be on as well to turn these genes on, twist, which is only going to be found in those cells. So you've got both general and specific, um, specific transcription factors, if that makes sense. So I, the general transcription factors are, are the T2F, T, T2FD series of transcription factors. But in terms of the specific ones, you've got some that are more general and more that some that are more specific to cell type. So this twist would be a really specific one. So uh, any gene that, um, that has this twist will only be turned on when that is there. Um, it may be exposed to TGF beta signaling and wind signaling and FGF signaling, but not have that and the gene doesn't get turned on. So again, you've got some really specific things and some that are more general. Okay, and unfortunately that's about all we got here. Esha, oh, I'm sorry, it's buying the, the is it binding at the promoter region of the gene or the entire gene? Okay, I'm not sure if I answered that question. I hope I did. Okay, 
Any questions or comments on this? This is all really general stuff. Hopefully you knew this already, um, but I needed to find common ground. No questions? That's about all I have for today. Can I talk to you after Yusuf? Okay, Yusuf, I will send you a, an email with a, with a Zoom link. Um, do you have a recording for Friday? Sorry. You know what happens, especially <laughs> advisement week is the worst because I'll have an advisement meeting and I'll record it on the Zoom, but after it's recorded, if I don't save it in a sp specific spot, it sits there waiting to save it. And then I do another recording on top of it and the second recording doesn't get made. So that's what happened on Friday. I lost Friday's recording. Um, what was Friday? Friday was chapter seven, wasn't it? I may be able to dig up an old version of chap of that lecture. I think I can. So I'll, I'll, I'll get last year. Uh, can you give the link from last? Damn, Anesha, you're way ahead of me. Um, I will see if I can find that. I think I can. And then I will put it up there for you guys. Would we all get extra credit for not leaving after you announced no quiz? Let's have a quiz now. Let's do it right now. Who's left? How many people? 24 people left. Okay. Let's go to this. Just be calm there, people. And it's setting. Let's don't turn anything on. We'll show them, won't we? Nobody messes with my class. Adding a quiz. Day four nineteen. Okay. Go. All right. So you've got three minutes to to uh, to do that quiz. And then we will call it a day. Okay, so I'm just going to close this Zoom. Who's got the answers? The date is wrong. Yeah, I know the date's wrong. Don't worry about that. I'll count it anyway. Later, dudes.